Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. Six. But as we continue on this morning with our study of the Beatitudes, or these statements of blessings, we come to verse six, the fourth Beatitude. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God's put a hunger in us, and because he has done such, he's going to fill it. He's obligated. He's going to fill it, and it's there. But the Lord Jesus here, he's speaking here about a, a strong desire, and a, a driving passion. You might say it, one that is a, a complete or a supreme ambition, takes precedence over everything else. And the words used by Jesus, hungering and thirsting, uh, they're, they're used in a much stronger sense of hungering and thirsting than, than what most of us have experienced. I mean, we probably think we've been hungry and most of us think we might have been thirsty in a football practice or whatever, but no, we hadn't, we hadn't really touched upon a real hungering and thirsting. But they, commun they communicate to us something of a, a deeply felt need even that something that we must have for survival. And you know, such a need's a characteristic of those that have been birthed into the family of God. Thereby, you know, we're indwelt by the Spirit of God. And as I've already said, He creates this appetite within us. Those who are in Christ should be characterized by a certain kind of a hunger and thirst, and one that's passionate, ambition, or it's an intense pursuit. And you know, it's not uncommon to mankind uh, to be intense, to be passionate, to be in pursuit of some lofty goal. I mean, a lot of people go through life like that. And in fact, you know, a lot of people, or most people, they spend their lives in pursuit of something. You know, they chasing after something. And, and of course, there are those who have perverted ambitions. There are those who maybe have no ambition. We see a lot of that. But even those that have ambitions for what on a human level might be noble, they find themselves at the end of their lives many times having never attained to what they pursued or even after having grabbed it, having attained to it, they found that it wasn't all that it was supposed to be. They come up short. It was just it just wasn't what they had set out chasing after. As I was meditating upon this the last couple of days, uh, uh, I was a little reluctant to use it, but... <laughs> There's a song that I used to listen to that come to mind. Brother Ralph, he'll reference George Jones once in a while. so, I've, And that's okay. He is a poet. But, but, but there was a song. It was written by a Georgia boy. And uh, it's a reflective of a life of, of righteous living, wrongfulness, wasted time, a life that's squandered. It's very reflective. I mean, it, 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 who is that? <laughs> but anyway, the name of that song was Old Before My Time, and it was written by Greg Allman. And, uh, but, you know, there, there are a couple quotes from those lyrics that came to mind as I was meditating upon these texts. And one of them was, he said in that song, he said, there are things that used to mean so much to me, but they've made me old before my time. But the second and the most profound, he was talking about looking back on his life. And he said, the road behind me now is paved with fool's gold. And I thought, that's tragic. That The road behind me now is paved with fool's gold. And it's tragic for one to get to the end of life and realize the vanity of how that life was spent. And you know, that don't just apply to the unsaved. It, it doesn't. It, it applies to the saved as well. It, it's easy to spend our lives or looking or focusing on the wrong thing. And it could be something noble, but that doesn't mean it ought to define our existence. Uh, you remember Jesus saying there in Matthew chapter 6, over in the next chapter in verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness 
as set forth here in our Lord's teaching. And it'll certainly define for us what we deem to be treasures of an eternal value. Now each week as we have progressed through these Beatitudes, each week I've, I've stressed to you how that each of these blessings, how they're, they're built upon one another. And now here in verse 6, verse 6 is somewhat unique to the rest because it's transitional. It not, not only because of what went before it, but because of what comes after it. And look at what follows there in verses 7 through 9. We already read it, but he says, Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And you know, until one has hungered and thirsted for righteousness and has been satisfied, they can't be merciful. They can't be pure in heart. They can't be a peacemaker until they've hungered and thirsted after that righteousness. And then the first three Beatitudes, they flow into this one. And then the next three, they flow out of it. You know, where there's a sense of moral bankruptcy, we've talked about that at length, that poverty of spirit that brings about a weeping over our sin or that mourning state, that brings about a meekness. And then the heart cries out for righteousness because of these things. And when that heart receives that righteousness, that individual then who has received mercy, they've received cleansing, they've made peace with God, they themselves, they'll become merciful. Pure in heart, they'll become a peacemaker. See, they'll be becoming more like Jesus as he's working in our lives. There is a blessed and wonderful sequence to the way these things are, are laid out before us. You know, this beatitude here, it's also, it's a pretty good litmus test to judge our spiritual health by. You know, we're called upon time and time again in the scriptures to examine ourselves. And, and, and that's for our own good. Make an honest assessment where we're at. And, and there is as much to be found on the negative side of this thing as it is on the positive. You know, we ask questions like, well, uh, what do I really hunger for? You know, and as you pillow your head at night, get to dwelling on some of these things. What, I, what is it that I really hunger for? You know, an honest assessment of that question, it, it tells us a lot about ourselves. It tells us a lot about our profession, our practice. What is the driving ambition of our lives? What's that compelling desire of our heart? You know, according to Jesus' teaching here, pretty black and white, he's saying that those who enter into the realm of his kingdom, they're those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. R.T. Kendall, who uh, I've been reading, was one of my references here. He, he's got a book on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. But he told of an incident when he was a young boy about not wanting to go to school one day. Imagine that. And uh, that's something I can relate to. You know, I laid out as often as I could get away with it. You, your mama wouldn't know that. But uh, Brother Kendall, he had a test coming up. He didn't, he didn't want to be there. And I can relate to that too. But, you know, this entire thing is something I can relate to. Been there and done that. But anyway, Brother Kendall said he got up and he told his mama, he said he didn't feel well and he didn't think he should go to school. And she replied, well, that's fine, son. You just go on and go back to bed. Hopefully you'll feel better. But then he messed up. He said, well, I would like to eat some breakfast before I go back to bed. <laughs> so uh, y'all probably heard something like that. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, her answer was, you know, well, if you got a good appetite, there's not, not much wrong with you. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and fix your breakfast while you get ready for school. Do you get what I'm saying here? You know, the moral of the story here is this. You know, if one has an appetite for God, then spiritually, there's not much wrong with them. You know, if a person's hungering and thirsting after righteousness, as described in Jesus' teaching, they're doing pretty good. Their spiritual health is, is doing well. You know, I know by experience that this desire, it can vary by degree. It can be up and be down based upon where our affections, both spiritual and fleshly, where that might lead us, take us. But no matter how far off course we might get or how we might drift, if we really belong to him, there's that compass of right that is within us. And that needle points us and it guides us back to him because he's put that there. He's not going to let it die away. It's, it's not going to completely fade. Now, I'm not 
trying to teach some kind of sinless perfection here. Please, please understand that. Me of all people, I, I wouldn't. Several months ago, you might recall, we had a series of lessons in Psalm 73. You remember that Psalm of Asaph, and just a quick reference here. But you recall that Asaph began to doubt the goodness of God because of the prosperity of the wicked. And describing this distraught condition that he had arrived at, he said in verse 2 of Psalm 73, but he says, as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. But if you read throughout that psalm, you might recall, I know Brother Mickey, he just started coming here and you heard that, but God restored Asaph. And it began when he took him into the temple. into, And that's why it's so important for us to stay in touch with the things of God that we might pursue after this righteousness that he's speaking of here. But anyway, he brings Asaph through all this and he restores him. And in Psalm 73, there at the end, he says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? That's a long ways from his feet were well nigh slipped. He said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? There's none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh, my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish, though thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord of God that I may declare all thy works. See, he was pursuing after that righteousness. God had led him back to that point. God's promise that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, that they're going to be filled. That means they're going to be satisfied. He's obligated to. He put that desire within us. And he's faithful. You know, he's not going to neglect that and for the remainder of our time now I want to talk about the degree of the desire and then I'm going to speak for a moment about the object of that desire that righteousness that's spoken of you know I thought as I was trying to put this together I've made the remark several times but these each of these beatitudes is just so rich that I have a hard time just trying to quantify and and, and condense it down into a little 30 minute Sunday school lesson I mean, each one of them, you could speak on it for hours. I'd really put you to sleep then, but Brother Ralph knows where I'm coming from here, and Brother Mickey does, many of you do. But it's hard to just pull it down into something that's just brief and concise. But So it might end up just being just a few scattered remarks. But anyway, Jesus said there again, he said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, <clears throat> what does it mean? What does it really mean to hunger and to thirst? You know how each of us interpret this? That's based on our own personal experience with hungering and thirsting. That's how we interpret just what that means. The idea is that it's that of an intense desire. You know, the force of Christ's words, they might not be clear to us because we don't know what it really is to be hungry and to be thirsty. You know, in the ancient world, they were dealing with a a, a scarcity of food. Food was hard to come by. The battle for bread, it was consuming. It it took up all the hours, all the waking hours of the day, all the planning moments of the night. Pretty much their existence was to obtain something to eat and something to drink. Remember, Jacob, back then, they fought over all them wells. You know, the water was so valuable. And there in the Middle East... There were windstorms that destroyed the crops. There were droughts. I think average rainfall in, in Jerusalem is about 15 inches a year. Most of that's coming in winter months, January, February. Uh, Galilee up north, it's probably a little more. And in the southern part of Israel, it's a lot less. It's mostly, that's desert, very arid. And, and it's against this backdrop that, de- that Jesus is teaching. And he said, the people in my kingdom are people who seek righteousness. You know, they want righteousness as much as the starving man who fears death wants food. And as a thirsty man who fears death wants water. So desperation is the key idea here. And you know, the following was given by several writers as an illustration of the severity of the degree to which this thirsting is speaking of. And it's a military story. So you cadets, y'all listen up. But in a book called The Last Crusade, it was written by a British major, Gilbert. And it gives an account 
of the British liberation of Palestine from the Ottoman Turks there at the end of World War I, which eventually led to the statehood of Israel in 1948. But there they were over there in this arid desert wasteland waging warfare. And the British, they liberated Palestine and allowed Palestine to become a state of its own. And the account says that there was driven up from Beersheba, which is in the south, a combined force of British, Australians, and New Zealanders, and they were pressing on the rear of the Turkish retreat over arid desert. And it says that the attack outdistanced its water-carrying camel train. They'd gotten past their water supply. They was run out of water. The water bottles was empty. The sun beat down upon them. The vultures was following them, waiting on food. And he said, he said, our heads ached. Our eyes became bloodshot and dim in the blinding glare. Our tongues began to swell. Our lips turned a purplish black and burst. Those who dropped out of the column were never seen again. But the desperate forces battled on to Shirera. And there were wells at Shirera. And they had to, and they had to press to where there was some water or they was going to die. And he said, we fought that day as men fight for our lives just traversing across that desert. And he said, we entered into Shirar Station on the hills of the retreating Turks, and the first objects which met our view were the great stone cisterns full of cold, clear drinking water and the still night air. And I said all, I read all that, to this quote, <clears throat> and it puts this whole thing in a nutshell. This major, he said, I believe Major Gilbert concludes that we all learned our first real Bible lesson on the march from Beersheba to Shirai Wells. If such were our thirst for God, he wrote, for righteousness, for his will in our life, a consuming, all-embracing, preoccupying desire, how rich in the fruit of the Spirit we would be. Yeah, that is a profound statement. And that's a vivid description of what Jesus is speaking of in our text. And even the Greek terms that are used to support this idea. Uh, uh, that word hunger, the Greek word is pianates, and it's from this verb called pianano, and, and it means to hunger, to suffer want, to be in need. And it's not talking about some little casual belly ache like I missed lunch or whatever. It's talking about a genuine a need. And then there's that word for thirst. It's dipsia. And it's the same word that our blessed Lord used when he said from the cross, I thirst. The most terrible thirsting you could imagine. These are the two strongest impulses in the natural realm. The need for food and the need for water. They'll trump everything else that we might think is important. But they, they, they will trump everything else. And it's also important to note that they're both present tense participles. And what that means, a continuing action. Debbie's laughing at me because her mama was an English teacher. And, uh, <laughs> well, I, I understood what they was telling me, but I had to be told this, but I didn't understand. But anyway, it means a continuous action. What this means, it's showing that this is a way of life, a constant hungering, constantly thirsting for that righteousness. You know, it reminds me of Moses. You remember Moses, he had quite the relationship with the Lord, all the way from that burning bush. You know, he'd been given the law of God. He'd been up on that mountain. He'd seen the glory of God as that cloud descended. And in obedience to God's command, he had erected the tabernacle. When that tabernacle was completed, you know, he'd gone into it, into the presence of God. And upon one of those occasions, he went in and he made a request that reveals what was really in his heart. After all Moses had experienced of God, he asked him in Exodus chapter 33, now think about what he had been through and what he had seen from the Lord, his mighty power leading them out and how he had just, just everything. But there in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13, Moses said, Now therefore... I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee. That I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Then on down in verse 18, Moses said, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. See, all that God had already shown him 
was only enough to create a greater appetite for more. This was an ongoing thing with him. He didn't pray a prayer of thanks, having seen the glory of God or having seen the hand of God in the marvelous ways that God had revealed himself up to that point. He didn't say, I've had enough or I'm sufficed. He said, show me more. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that was what was in his heart. David, you remember David, he walked in such a close communion with God that he wrote many psalms about God's presence. And they tell of how David enjoyed and rejoiced in the presence of the Lord and how he was comforted and how his people were comforted by the presence of the Lord. And you remember it was David who said, probably one of the most well-known verses from the Old Testament, Psalm 23, 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But yet over in Psalm 63, a good while later, he said in verses 1 and 2, he said, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. See, David was always wanting more, always hungering. He was always thirsting. How about Paul? You know, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he said, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. You know, we could argue that Paul knew Christ better than anybody knew him in the New Testament in one sense. But Paul could argue back, I don't know him well enough. And all that I know about him elevates my want to know him even more. You know, Paul went on to write there in that same chapter in verses 13 through 14. He said, Brother, and I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Peter wrote in Second Peter 3.18, he said, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So as I said a moment ago, the implication here is that this hungering and thirsting after righteousness, it's a continuous thing. It's a way of life. Constantly hungering, constantly thirsting for righteousness. And that righteousness, that is the objective of the desire, just to be right with God. Righteousness. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, and I quote him, he said, to hunger and thirst after righteousness is to desire to be free from self in all its horrible manifestations, in all its forms. When we considered the man who is meek, we saw that all that really means is that he's free from self in its every shape and form. Self-concern, pride, boasting, self-protection, sensitiveness, a desire to protect self and glorify self. And he goes on to say, but the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness is a man who longs to be free from all that. He wants to be emancipated or freed from self-concern in every shape and form. And what's notable, oh, this is a statement here. He said, what's notable is he's overwhelmed that the truest thing about himself is that he is wicked and sinful. And you know, that's what initiates salvation, when God pricks our hearts and makes that a reality to us. But get this, it's a two-fold, two-direction street there. It's also, what per, it's also that which uh, perpetuates that pursuit of righteousness, even after God saved us. We sense our own, uh, just how bad that we really are, how wicked, how sinful. It makes us cry out for that righteousness. You see what he said, said, blessed are they, happy are they when we're pursuing such a thing. And you know, when we speak of righteousness, uh, that's a broad and vast meaning associated. And, and all of them are related to that which we should hunger and thirst after. But there's one meaning that is more applicable than the rest. Yeah, I'll press on for a moment here, but <clears throat> but first there is righteousness that there is a righteousness that in the Old Testament is synonymous with salvation. In Isaiah chapter forty-five, verse eight, Isaiah wrote, "Drop down ye heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. 
Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. In Isaiah 46, 12 through 13, it says, Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So we see here, that's just a couple examples of this righteousness that is synonymous with salvation as it's used in the Old Testament. But let's go a little bit further. You know, taking it in its widest latitude, to hunger and thirst after righteousness means to yearn after God's favor, His image, His blessedness. Righteousness here is a term denoting all spiritual blessedness. We already read in Matthew 6.33 where he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All spiritual blessings. And more specifically, righteousness in our text has reference first to the righteousness of faith. And don't lose me here. I know I'm at the end of this. Probably the most important thing I got to say is right here in these next couple of moments. But more specifically, righteousness in our text has reference first to the righteousness of faith, whereby a sinner is justified freely by divine grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And as a result of his surety, or as a result of our surety, Christ Jesus the Lord, as a result of his obedience being imputed to us, put to our account, his righteousness, not ours. We don't have any. And we still don't have any apart from what he's given to us. But that which has been imputed to us, the believer, we stand legally righteous before God, justified. I remember at work, you know, everybody turns into a theologian when they get saved. And it was a bunch of us, too, that God saved at one time. And, and uh, I, I remember me and this guy arguing, and I, I can't remember all the argument, but, but you know, we, we're still we was brothers. And, but it was talking about uh, this justification. I said, if you couldn't get saved without him moving upon you, well, how in the world would you say saved? You know, if he wasn't involved in it. You see what I'm saying? It's Christ's righteousness. It's not our own. But <clears throat> as sinners who have constantly broken the law in thought, word, and deed, we're utterly, we're destitute of righteousness. We know from Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. But God has provided for us a perfect righteousness in Christ for all who believe. You remember that story of the prodigal son? It is the best robe put upon each returning prodigal. Put the best robe, put that ring upon him. The merits of Christ's perfect keeping of the law is reckoned to the account of every sinner who shelters in him. And certainly blessed are they who hunger and thirst after that righteousness at the onset of salvation. When God quickens our understanding and when he brings them to himself. But secondly, this righteousness for which the awakened sinner longs, that's to be understood of inward and a sanctifying righteousness. You know, justification and sanctification, uh, they're never to be severed. I don't already stressed enough that God has placed this desire within us. You know, the one in whom the Spirit works desires not only an imputed righteousness, which we talked about, Christ's righteousness, but we desire an imparted one or an implanted one that he puts in us. He not only longs for a restoration to God's favor, but to have God's image renewed in him. And, and, and this twofold righteousness, the convicted, they hunger and they thirst, and, and the soul's conscious of this going on. You know, in bodily hunger and in bodily thirst, there's some uh, painful pangs that go on. If you really, you starting to get hungry and, and your stomach's starting to gnaw or your mouth's starting to get really parched, there's some things going on. This body's aware of it. Same way with the pursuit of this righteousness. It longs for relief. And so it is with the soul. You know, the Spirit brings before the conscience the holy and unescapable requirements of God. That's grace. God could just let us just go right on and not and just let us drop right on off into hell. But he must bring before us the unescapable requirements of God. And next he convicts the soul of its destitution and its guilt. 
so that he realizes his poverty, his poverty and his lost condition, and seeing there is no hope in and from himself, and then he creates a deep hunger and thirst that causes him to look into and seek relief from Christ, from what he's done for us. The Lord, our righteous. And you know, like the previous one, and I'm done, but like the previous ones, this fourth beatitude, it describes a dual experience. There is that initial and there is that continuous. That which begins in the unconverted and continues on to be perpetuated in the saved sinner. Uh, there is a repeated exercise of this grace and it's felt at varying uh, intervals or times in our pilgrimage here on this earth. Now, the one who longed to be saved by Christ he now yearns to be made like him. It ought to be. And I know that ebbs up and down and, you know, it's going to be times that God will shake us and rattle us and get us back. But it's so important that we stay in touch with the things of God because if we don't, you know, we can, we can stray and really get set adrift and then he's going to have to get pretty harsh on us to, to, you know, get us back in tune or back in line. But blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Amen. What a promise. Amen. Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family. And I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm.